the holiday meeting. And uh, um, anyway, my name is Walt. I live in West Haven. My um, I've had three NDEs, but the um, the most recent event well happened about eight years ago. My wife passed away, um, September fourth, two thousand thirteen. So eight years ago, a little bit, a little bit more than that. And this is what happened the night she passed. Okay. Uh, she'd been in the hospital for two weeks. Her blood pressure was very, very low. And uh, we were visiting. I was visiting her every day during the day. And then my son, uh, I would leave, and my son would visit her at night. Uh, this was a Tuesday night. And on Tuesdays, I have a friend named Ron, and we would go to the post mall and just have a cup of coffee and just sit for a couple of hours and chat. And this particular night, September 4th, uh, we were sitting at the mall and uh, my uh, cell phone rang. Nobody ever calls me on my cell phone, so it was strange. But anyway, I answered it and it was my son. And he said, Dad, I'm at the hospital with Mom. We've got some important decisions to make. You better get here. So I said, okay, Mike. I said, I'll run, take me home, and then I'll drive to the hospital. So my experience was this. Uh, I got my car, and I'm driving to the hospital, St. Rayfield's in New Haven. And to get there from West Haven, I took the back roads, and I was going driving up the L.T. Grasso Boulevard in New Haven. It was a pretty long, straight road. And all of a sudden, I must have been doing, doing 55, 60 on this road. There was no traffic, and I was just speeding. And all of a sudden, there were in the passenger side, and I was alone in my car, but in the passenger seat, in the front seat, there was like a gray little cloud uh, moving uh well, like dust or something, something like that, as best as I can describe it. Anyway, what I heard was, you don't have to speed. I'll still be here when you get there. And that just made me, I don't know, relaxed or whatever. And I slowed down to... uh to, you know, like the speed limit, 30 miles an hour or whatever it is. And I got to the hospital, went up to my wife's room, and there were a couple nurses in there, and my wife was covered up to her neck with a, in a sheet. And my son was there by himself, and I, we hugged each other, and he said, Dad, she passed. And, uh, and I said, how long ago? He said, oh, about 20 minutes. So I, that, if she had passed already, that was my wife in that little gray area on the, uh, in the passenger seat talking to me and telling me not to, not to speed, that she'd still be here when I get there. So I asked my, so... I hugged my son again, and we we kind of cried a little bit. But I said, "How did it happen?" He said, "Well, he said I was standing here next to her, next to her bed, talking to her, and he put her hand over his face, palm up, and he said, and suddenly, Mom said, this is my wife, my son's telling story. My he said, Mom said, I'm passing.'" And then he lit, his hand lifted straight up in the air. And, and that was it. And she passed. So somehow he was, I, I never got him to say it or admit it. We, but I think my son saw her leaving, passing. Uh, and in the, Interesting thing is I said to her, 
I said to my son, did you call your Aunt Marie? That's my wife's sister. And he said, no. So I called her and told her what had, that Jane and my wife passed. And so he, uh, she said, I'll be right there. So she came to the hospital with her daughter and um, my niece and my son, Mike. He related the same story to his Aunt Marie. And he put his hand right over my wife's face, palm up, and the same, and he used the same words, the same description, and his hand lifted, saying, uh, and I'm passing. And the same thing, same thing happened. That was, uh, to me, that was very significant, that, that he, he was there to see this. And, uh, and, uh, I didn't get there. I didn't get there for a passing, but I did see something after she had passed, and she talked to me. Uh, so, um, so that's my story. That's the end. Well, thank you, Walter. That was. Uh... That was a very interesting, uh, the fact that you were receiving this message in your car at the time that she passed. Yeah, yeah, she knew where I was, I guess. <laughs> well, she didn't want you to get in a car accident speeding, that's for sure. Yeah, right, or or get a ticket, <laughs> either one. But yeah, right, it slowed me down. So, Walter, have you had any uh, other visitations since? Oh, since? Yeah, in my, uh, I've had a lot of, well, over the eight years, I've had a lot of dreams. That's Tina, right? Are you Tina? Yes, that was Tina. Oh, okay. Uh, so, I've had a lot of dreams about my wife. Some of them make sense to me. Some of them don't. And, uh, but, um, uh, some I don't even want to talk about. Uh, one was very, very long and I still remember, but, but I'd rather not talk about it. And, uh, um, hmm. How about your son? Has he had any visitations? I don't know. I try to get him to open up about it. And he does believe in, he's had other spiritual encounters. But, so he believes in uh, NDEs and, you know, spiritual encounters and stuff like that with the dead. But uh, he, I can't, if he has, he won't open up to me about it. And so, uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know if he has. Okay. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you, you, Walter. For those that don't know, Walter used to be the co-facilitator for uh, our group. And then after his wife passed, he, he had asked me to help him out. And that's how I got into this job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. From what I understand, you guys have really progressed with this meeting. I mean, you, you're on, uh, uh, what do you call, on uh, these uh, virtual meetings, so it's just great. Yeah, thank God to uh, Sue Maisano and Bethany Silver. I call them uh, the uh, tech angels. <laughs> mm. Oh, and I would like to say this to everybody, okay? Uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, Lori uh, raised her hand. She wants to say something to you, Walt. Yes, I, I had a question for Walt. Walt, um, did you feel, um, uh, I don't know, were you upset that you did not make it to the hospital uh, to see your wife pass, or were you satisfied that she came to visit you in your vehicle? Oh, I wasn't, uh, I was not upset. Uh, well, how could I be? I mean, you know, it happened, you know, and, uh, 
you know, I was going to uh, this, uh, you know, the NDE meeting for like since the year 2000. So I was going to the meeting about 13 years, and I've heard a lot, a lot of stories, uh, you know, uh, about NDEs and encounters and uh, spiritual encounters and a whole bunch of stuff that really made me, um, made it easy for me to accept the fact that my wife had passed um, without being upset. Uh, yeah, I miss her. I miss, I still miss her, you know, but uh, uh, I, I, I was not upset that I didn't get there. And uh, I, I think I was grateful that she came and talked to me in the car. And that's how that's how I felt. That was a gift for sure. Yes, it was. Yeah, and then my son's story that even uh, 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 what do you call it made it uh, even more more real. Mm -hmm. uh, the way he. Thank the way you. I watched him describe it. Very good. Thank you, Walter. Oh, you're welcome. <clears throat> um, I, uh, is there anyone else who would like to share something they need to share, or shall we move on to the open forum? No, no one? Okay. Um, I rearranged the uh, topics that have been submitted for discussion. And the first one is from Tina, uh, who has a question about extraterrestrials. Tina, do you want to uh, yes. question? Yes. Okay, so as I, I've been doing this for since Walter, uh, you know, left the, the group, I've been uh, booking uh, people to speak. And now, of course, it's much easier because it's online. <laughs> I uh, book people from all over the country, basically, so that's it's wonderful. Anyways, through the process of interviewing people, I have encountered a few people that said that they had seen extraterrestrials, uh, communicated with them, mental telepathy and all that, but most of them right. were still processing and they were not willing to uh, speak uh, for our group yet. So this is why the question is, in this group, does anyone else, has anyone else had encounters with the uh, UFOs or extraterrestrials? Hi, Tina. Hi. And Sue Maizano has her hand up. Okay, so Tina asked about uh, extraterrestrial encounters, right? Yeah. Okay, I had one when I was eight years old. I was uh, playing at a friend's house. There were like uh, six or seven kids together and the mother. Um, was this in China? Yeah, I was in yeah. China. And uh, we were we were playing. Suddenly, we saw dark clouds on the east. So we look into the into the sky. There was a face in the sky uh, from the dark cloud. It was very scary. Um, the being saw us, and they were trying to scare us. So we were so afraid to look at it. But at the same time, we were so curious uh, what's what's happening. And this is a giant angry face. And then from the right of that face, there seems to be an ocean, like waves and a boat. Those the ancient Chinese boat. And then there's um, there's someone uh, rolling the boat. And then there is a lady in a dress in that boat, beautiful lady in the boat. So we couldn't know what's going on, uh, what's the story. But it happened for a long time, for a few minutes, and uh, my friend's mom saw it too. She's a grown-up, and uh, 
so it's not just one person; it's a group of people saw it, and then、uh, it was super scary. Eventually, it dissipated. Everything returned back to the normal. So when I was walking home, I was so scared. I was constantly checking the sky, see what's going on,、uh, trying to make the story. It seems like、um, he's trying to seize this girl in the boat, but we don't know exactly what the story was. So that was.、Uh, Uh, I I personally experienced that, that I couldn't make sense of that. I started telling my friends at school, but they laughed at me. They said, "Oh, you saw? You think you saw God?" Like they they were like making fun of me. And another time, I was、uh, about thirteen years old.、Uh, that was a secondhand experience. I was my cousin saw it. There was a girl in town,、uh, in the village. And her grandmother passed away, and then,、um, and then this girl, the ghost, came back. And first, there was a being on top of the roof. There was a lot of people saw it, and then she floated down to the girl, and、uh, made her sleep or something. There was something going on. There's a group of people surrounding, looking what's going on. When my cousin told me about this, she saw it, and then she told me about it. I felt like, I felt like my soul lifted up, so scared、um, that you feel the detachment from your body. And then she said, eventually the grandmother flew away as a bird, and then. When she said that, I heard flapping wings from inside the house. I was so scared. I guess it could be my mind making that up.、Um, it was just、uh, that was the secondhand experience. The other one was the firsthand. And also, my uncle died、uh, from an accident when she was he was thirty eight. It was very sudden. And then someone from the village told my grandma that he saw my.、Um, My uncle walking towards the mountains after he died already. So that was、uh, another secondhand experience. So it's very yeah, it's very strange that、uh, I was curious.、Uh, where's the what are they like? Especially the face that I saw. There's certainly a being behind it. We don't know their intention. There seemed to be a story going on, so、uh, I want to share with everybody. See if someone has experiences like that. I don't have an experience like that, but I have a question for you, Sue. Did you ever try to draw what you saw or research pictures to see if you could find out something similar? No, I never seen something similar like that. It was、uh, the face was very, very real, and has emotions behind it. You can see it's a being. It's like if you look into someone's eyes, you know they are there. So it's as real as that.、Um, it is. It feels like an angry being, kind of like a demon. But <laughs> I don't know the story behind it, and it seems like. He doesn't want us to know what's going on, because we were looking at the sky. He doesn't want to be known. That's the feeling I got. Interesting. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Yeah. In my research, in, as I、uh, interview people, I have、uh, come to learn that many times、uh, they their memory was wiped. Away from these、uh, experiences until like later on in their lives, there were、mm. their experiences became clear again.、Mm. I I didn't feel losing memory. I didn't.、Um, it was very crystal clear the feelings looking at the being. Maybe I knew what's going on, but then wiped out the memory. That that I don't know. But you felt? Did you feel that it was a, a benevolent entity or not? 
feel like it's not. I feel like there's some intention behind it, but we don't know what the intention is. I feel like the girl was escaping from him, and he's trying to seize the girl. That's the mm, feeling I got. And this girl is kind of like a goddess um, in the boat, rolling away. Interesting. Okay, uh, Tina. Yes. Uh, Miss Jack, I, uh, I have a, a story that um, I want to share about extraterrestrials or whatever. Okay. This goes back over half a century when I was in high school. And uh, we, I lived in Indiana, New Chicago, Indiana, and uh, Chicago was right next to our uh, town. So we were, uh, there were six of us, and we were in a car returning. Uh, we had gone to the uh, prom, and in those days, uh, the big band was the thing, and uh, uh, we went to this uh, place in Chicago with a big band, uh, and as it turned out, the songstress was actually from our high school um, a, a few years earlier. Anyway, on our way home, this is about midnight, um, I'm sitting in the back seat on the, uh, behind the driver, and I'm sort of slouched and looking up at the sky, <clears throat> and we're driving along um, the, the outer drive in Chicago. And I, I, I noticed what I thought was an airplane. Uh, it was a light, and it was flying. Uh, it, it was moving uh, from uh, right to left, and uh, uh, so not beyond beyond that was the moon. But anyway, so I'm, I'm watching this, and suddenly it stopped. And I thought, oh, he's turning and he's coming at me, right? I mean, so it looks like he's standing still. But no, it just went on and on and on uh, for at least 10 minutes. And then I, um, th then the car turned, I, I couldn't see anymore. But, <clears throat> but that, was, um, that was my first encounter. And that was before uh, UFOs were uh, being, uh, you know, investigated and promoted and talked about. Anyway, FYI, that's it. Thank you for sharing that, Jack. Anyone else want to share anything about UFOs? Hi, can I say something? Sure. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, no, this is Bonnie from West Haven. Oh, Bonnie. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> so no, Diane I, is the after. Okay, very good. Uh, Hi, well, you, Hi, hon. I just wanted to say, you know, like, um, I'm one of those sleepers, okay, that uh, with the experiences, I guess I put it in the back of my mind, and um, then someone came to me that I met, and she used the right word, and it seemed to, like, just waken me right up. It's like, it was like a password, and then everything else, then everything came right out of me just pouring out of me. And um, I have had experiences with ETs. Um, I also feel that our psychic ability and their death experiences are also part of the whole, whole enchilada. Um, uh, my first experience was at five years old. And um, I kept on thinking over the years, over the years, I kept on thinking that maybe uh, this being that I kept on seeing, which was a little girl that had passed because I had playmates on the street, which there was only five houses on the street. So when I told my mother about this, this person, this, this little girl that used to come, she never talked to me, but she would always crop up behind me and want to tickle me and make me laugh. Uh, anyways, my mother would say that's impossible. And even before my mother died a couple of years ago, 
She even said it. I asked her again, and she goes, it's impossible. And I know why it was impossible, because where you could see where she came from, there was no houses. It was like off a cliff. Now, how does a little being, okay, a little girl come from a cliff, like I said, but knowing all my experiences um, from the other side and ETs, um, I realized that that was probably my first ET, my little, one of my short visitors. But um, I have had uh, visitations. Um, I, I, did, I don't like to use the word abduction anymore because now I'm seeing that um, they really are, well, they are our friends. Because um, if they wanted to hurt me, they certainly could have had more than enough time to do it. But um, I just know that um, with everything that's going on, they keep on, they're trying to help us. I know that. I know that. And um, I know, Tina, I'll be seeing you again to get in more details of this. Thank so. you. Thank you, Bonnie. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anyone else? Otherwise, we'll go to the next uh, topic. I think Diane had her hand up. Oh, yes, that's right. Diane? Did she leave us? <laughs> OK. I'm she, trying to figure out how to unmute. I oh, think good, I figured good. it out. Okay, Diane, um, go ahead. Actually, I took my hand up. I'm so confused. And I, I'm glad you called, Bethany. Thank you. I am confused. I don't know what to think about all of this. I don't know whether to say the word extraterrestrial. I don't know what that means. For me, I have a very spiritual connection with a lot of stuff <laughs> that I don't think of as extraterrestrial. I think of as my spiritual self, my angels, my spiritual guides. I've actually also experienced, and this is not something I tell anybody except my son, but this is a forum I can speak. I've had dudes in my house. In my house, doesn't happen a lot. Happens like years, five, 10 years. And then profound things happen and I'm given information. I never thought of this as extraterrestrial. I am always thought of this as a gift from my angels. But I keep hearing these words and I don't, have an opinion i have an awareness that something is there and that maybe it's the nde that gets you a little more in tune and you can feel this i don't know so i'm listening and i just don't know and i have actually this has been a very serious conversation for me and i did i did talk to my son about this, who I will converse with everything that happens to me. And he is feeling is, hey, maybe there's two things going on. So there's my question. Are there two things going on? Are we experiencing the same things? And some of us say, oh, my God, here it is. Thank you. I am in touch with my higher self. And other people saying, oh, it's extraterrestrials getting in touch with me. That's a question. And it's a serious and loving question. And I wish I understood. So there's where I am. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Jim had his hand up. Jim, are you still there? Jim Bruton? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, can't, I was oh, pressing the unmute okay. button and it was just sitting there looking at me, so I'd press it a few times. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I am curious, why is there such a common touch point between near-death experiencers and people who have experiences with UFOs or aliens and stuff like that? I mean, it really does seem to come up a lot. And they were saying that the after... And again, for want of a better word, if I use the word abduction, I'm not I'm not uh, intimating any subjective quality to that word. Uh, but I'm wondering that they've said that many abductees afterwards 
experience many of the same after effects as people who have had a near-death experience. So, the, the, but the connection is elusive to me. It's not intuitive. Does anyone have any insight on that or any thoughts? It's a Hi, Tina. Go ahead. Can I, can I say something? Please. Okay. Um, first of all, with Diane, okay, I totally agree. I feel that they are loving beings of light. And I do feel that they are our protectors, our guardians. Okay. Um, that, that I feel very strongly. Uh, as far as Jim goes, um, I feel that my near death experience happened at 15, but before 15, I was having psychic abilities from the age of five till then. And then after my near death, then everything started to really ramp up on me. I felt that I've always lived in two worlds, which was very depressing. Now I know what everything's what's going on. And yes, we are being all brought together for um, a, a great purpose. And, um, and us that can see and feel and know, okay, uh, whether it's a sensing, whether it's knowing, uh, whether it's feeling, whether it's seeing, whether it's hearing, whatever the senses are, okay? The point is, is that we're all being, okay, brought together. And so I don't, like I said, I don't like to use the word abductions anymore. I think with the word abduction way back when, when I had my first abduction that I know of, it was frightening. And I talked about it for two days and then I didn't talk about it for years. And then when I had the second abduction, okay, that was more traumatizing. But then I found out exactly what was going on. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I must have more visitations because I also can see them. I see them as being of light, lucid, okay? You know, very light forming, okay? And um, so it's like, you know, I don't know what else to say at this moment. But I just wanted to to talk to Diane and Jim about that. But like I said, I'm very loving towards um, our guardians. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Jack? Uh, I wanted to ask, could you uh, describe your uh, what the abductions were like? Bonnie? Are you talking to me? Yes. Uh, yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> the first one, okay. <laughs> Here we go. Um, that I know of, okay, was me and another psychic. We were going to do a psychic party in Monroe, Connecticut. And it was like, you know, we were, we were doing, you know, it was, that's what we did. You know, I did psychic fairs. I read people all over, you know, did everything. It was wonderful. But anyways, we were on our way. We were about a block away by my calculations to the house. And all of a sudden, I'm hyperventilating, which I don't normally hyperventilate. Um, and she's sitting over and next to me, and she says, you know, Bonnie, you're hyperventilating. She goes, you need a bag? <laughs> like, I don't carry a bag in the car. And I said to her, I know it. And I was like breathing so heavy. And I would had my hands on the wheel and I'm turning it right. I'm turning it left. I'm turning it right back and forth, back and forth. I said, I can't find the road. And it was dark in front of me, very dark, which it wasn't dark at the time. Okay, when I had mentioned to her, we're almost there. So then I said to her, I said, could you do me a favor? I said, could you lock your door? And she said to me, my window's down. I said, well, roll it up. So then, okay, I stopped hyperventilating. And then I said to her, I said, I won't mention her name. Okay, I can't. I, I would love to, but I can't. Anyways, I, I turned around. I said, look behind me. I said, it's all gray in the rear view, Mira, in the back, the rear view. And I said, why is it dark here? No road, but it's gray in the back. And that was it for the while. And then... I don't know how long afterwards, okay, um, we were down, like if we were driving like nothing happened, 
And all she said to me, I said, oh, here we are. We pulled in the lady's driveway. And she says, she says, oh, you know, she says, Bonnie, you know, we lost about, um, we lost about an hour time. I said, yeah, yeah, that's all I said. And I said, well, let's not talk about this until after our show. And then we'll, we'll go when we go out to dinner at the diner here in town. I said, we'll talk about it. She said, okay. We walked in to do this party, and one of the ladies said to me, she goes, you know, you, you guys are about an hour late. <laughs> and I just looked at the other girl that I was with, and I said, yeah, we know. We're sorry. You know, we got, we got sidetracked. So anyways, we ended up going in the back room. One lady, she was like, Oh, like she just wanted, she says, they're late. I got to get going. Let me have a reading, blah, blah, blah. So they said, you don't mind. So we took off our jacket, blah, blah, blah. And so anyways, all I know is, is that one, one of the other, the other psychic said, um, hi, nice to meet you, who she was. And me, of course, I put my hand out to say, hi, I'm Bonnie. Um, nice to meet you. She grabbed my hand and she left out a mortifying scream that she said, ah, you've been abducted and ran out of the house. And I looked at the other the lady and she looked at me and we knew and now we said nothing to nobody. Okay. Then the hostess comes in and she said, what did you do to her? And then we told her what I told you. She goes, Oh my God. She goes, you got to tell me all about it. I said, well, um, yeah, well, let's get the party started. And that was that. And then, of course, later on, we talked about more on um, me and the lady after at the diner. And then, Bonnie, yeah. At, uh, yes. Bonnie, uh, yes. Did, can you just go to where you actually saw someone uh, where you can describe? I think that was Jack's question. Right, Jack? Okay, where, where I actually, well, when the memory came back, okay, what I actually saw was from the first, okay, is that I was, Standing in front of a tree, okay, with a pack of cigarettes and a lighter, which I used to smoke back then. Okay, that was like 84, between 84 and 86, 19, you know, around there. And I was standing there, and um, and then what happened is, is that after that, I guess I was being returned, or I was in the facility by the UFO itself, the um, the spaceship. And then when I uh, got back, okay, I noticed that a man in black came afterwards, all right, down when I got down, okay, and um, I felt like I was being, I don't know, it's like memory, taking your memory away, because I did, because all I could see is like rose-colored glasses on me, and the man in black, okay, obviously is a shape sh shape shapeshifter, which is, you know, our, our buddies, the guardians just wanted to protect all the information wanted to protect me. Maybe it wasn't the right time, which, you know, and then what they look like though is actually, um, I saw three short ones that first time and second time as well, plus others. And then I saw, you know, a couple of tall ones, but they, they're the grays. They're the grays. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're not, they're not harmful. So they're gray, and uh, the, the, can you describe it further than that? What did they look like? The the face and all that. Yeah, well, the the gray. Uh, what I the, I pronounced okay. What I I'm like I look basically into their uh, their head, their face. Okay, because they don't they don't verbally talk. It's all energy. It's all like like telepathy, mind 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 to mind. Okay, and uh, basically, um, the, the eyes, they're kind of like almond shape. Okay, to me, they look dark. Okay, they didn't look um, malevolent or anything like that. I wasn't afraid on that level. It was just like I just didn't know why this was happening. That's all at the time. And, um, and then the shoulders were pronounced, their hands. They seemed to look, be a little bit longer. I didn't see their feet because their feet were like where I couldn't see, but I could see like the shape of their legs. Um, and I didn't, you know, I just, 
but they were great. They were great. So I just, uh, you know, just did what they said. I whatever I had to do, I did. Thank you, Bonnie. Jack, did she answer your question? Bonnie, how long were you with them? Oh my God! Well, the first time was an hour. Okay, because that's that's what we lost an hour time. Because if we had gotten to that party without that first distraction, uh, we would have been on time. So I had to be an hour, you know, our time. With their time, I don't know. I really don't know. Okay. But I've had out of bodies astral travel way before this abduction. Or again, I don't like to use the abduction taken. And I believe that's what I'm saying from five years old that they've been around me all that time. Because I've had too many things happen to me that I really, I can't really explain. You know, so, and the second, the second time was when I lived in South Carolina and that happened. They projected like they were in my house, but I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I think they had like beamed me up Scotty to the spaceship. Okay. And then when they were done with me, I think they were changing my vibration back into where I, where they had taken me from. And um, because I had an awful lot of pain and I told them that you've got to stop this because you're killing me. And then they did. And I saw them. I saw the two little ones by me, one by my foot and one by my ears and my head, which they put their hands over my ears to help with the pain, to stop the pain. And then I I said mentally to the two, one tall, one one short one. And I said, where are you going? Because my son was sleeping in the other room. And they said, we're just going to check up on him. So I believe he was taken, too. And that's another story, <laughs> too, as well. So Thank you, Bonnie. You're welcome. Anyone else uh, want to touch on this further? Or we can go to the next topic? Okay. Uh, the next topic uh, was uh, uh, is from Patrick. And Patrick, are you one of the phone telephone numbers? Patrick, are you here? Okay. Well, let me, uh, um, his question is, he's asking if any attendees know of a deathbed vision uh, that their family or friends have had. A deathbed vision. Sue? Hi. Hold on Somebody a second. Talking? Sue was first. Okay, go ahead. ahead. Sue? Okay, so my my grandma passed away a few years after I came to America. Well, towards the end, uh, she has a lot of uh, visions or hallucinations or uh, events other people cannot confirm. She, But she has conviction that it happened. She told my dad that I went back home and I brought her goodies, but my my dad was hiding from her. And uh, she spoke with conviction, but my dad told my grandma, no, I didn't go back because I didn't. But uh, like she's, but she, I guess my soul maybe traveled back to see her. Um, that's is something that uh, I I think that's what happened and because she, projection she wanted to yeah it's a it's a mental projection that um, she wanted to see me so she had a mental experience that was uh, um, right before she passed away like toward the end she has a lot of uh, hallucinations she thinks something happened and then uh, it actually didn't happen. But in her mind, it did happen. So that's what I want to share with everyone. Thank you, Sue. Now, I know that Laura has been working with uh, hospice patients, so you must have a couple of stories. Laura? Yes, I have many stories, but a few that are pretty significant. Um, one of my friends who was suffering from cancer, I was going to the hospital uh, 
pretty much on a daily basis doing Reiki on her. And the day before she passed, she told me that she saw her father in the curtain around her bed. And the next day she passed. So I'm sure that that's who came to get her. I, I know I'm positive that when people are in their transition, someone always comes to greet them and helps them cross over. They're never alone. Um, it's happened many times to me. I've seen people reach up to the ceiling. I've seen people staring at the ceiling. I've seen people call out a name. But the most significant one was my, my um, I had, I'd been called to uh, Manchester Hospital to sit with a woman who was in her transition so her husband could take a break. So I went there. I'd never met this woman before. And the reason I got into hospice work was because of my mom. When she was in, in hospice, I was so impressed with the people that came to the house. So when I retired, I decided I wanted to do that to give back for her. <clears throat> and I have several psychic friends, and they all tell me that, that my mother's always with me when I do that work. So I went to the hospital to see this woman, and for some reason, her bed was raised all the way up. So she was laying on the bed. Her back was elevated a little bit, but she was like eye to eye with me. And so the, she was whispering to me, asking me questions after her husband left. And the whole time I was talking to her, she was looking to my left and, and not to me. And I'm talking to her and she's looking to my left, looking to my left. So finally I said to her, do you see someone over here? And she nodded her head. And I said, do you know who it is? And she nodded her head. And I said, can you tell me who it is? And she said, plain as day, your mother. And I said, my mother? And she said, yes, she's beautiful. And that was such a confirmation for me that um, I've always felt that my mother was with me when I do that work, but that was such a confirmation. Um, I left there just smiling for hours, <laughs> knowing that, that this woman had actually seen my mom. And when my mother was in her transition, she had these dreams. She thought she said they were dreams, but I know that they were visits. They were visitations. She was crossing over and coming back. And some psychic friends of mine had told me afterwards that they were preparing her. She was very frightened. And so she had these visions, dreams, she said, of um, crossing over to the other side. One time she told me that three angels came to to visit her and they were getting her ready to leave. They were brushing her hair. They put flowers in her hair. They put a white dress on her, but then they didn't take her. And when she woke up, she was crying because she wanted to go with them. And my only explanation was it's just not time yet, but they're, they're getting you ready. And then another time she said, I just met JFK. She had always admired JFK and she said, I just met him. And she, he's such a wonderful person. And just stories like that, um, that I know now that she had crossed over and come back several times just to prepare her so that she wouldn't be frightened. Thank you, Laura. With confirmations like that, how can you possibly be yeah. afraid of dying, right? Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so... Uh, Sue, did you have your hand up before? Yes, it's, um, it's a small story I, um, that I was reminded uh, when I was a kid, just a few years old, seven. I had an uncle. He's uh, one of the youngest uncles. He was uh, 21. So he, he actually had to drop out of school very early because he had a, a blood related disease. He was dying. He was waiting to die. Um, so when the day he was dying, my mom told me I need to go and fetch my dad. So I rode the bike. Uh, when I was passing their house, their house was facing the street and he was in that room 
um, to die. The parents were around. It was very tragic because he's very young, and he doesn't want to die. I hear the screaming because in Chinese culture, there's a saying: when people die, there are two entities come with chains to to get you. It was a very scary story they tell people. So in his mind, he's thinking, you know, he's being uh, taken forcefully by these entities with chains. So when I was passing their 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 house, I hear the screaming. He said, uh, "Mom and Dad, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Save me!" It was really um, make your heart sunk, and uh, I, I felt so scared. And I heard, I actually heard chains, like chains trying to wrap around his feet. That chain dragging on the floor, I actually heard that sound. In in um, in the midst of his uh, um, you know, screaming, um, don't want to die, and he was saying they coming to get me, like, so 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 it's something that I heard and the the chain sound that I heard. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but it was very tragic. I'm pretty. Sh- I'm sure when he get out of the body, he will be more peaceful. But at that moment, um, uh, that fear was a very strong memory in my mind at a seven year old. So I got to feel okay. This is death. It's so scary. Um, so that's the kind of my vision of somebody's death. And I always had the fear of death as a young age because I had um, uncles that died at uh, 38. And that uncle was 21 when he died. He was uh, the first uh, death that I, um, my family had for my memory. So it was um, very scary. Um, just want to share. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I, I bet you're not afraid anymore, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Right now, I feel like I'm past that point. Now I know what's going on. Very I can good. talk about it uh, in peace. But right. my family, they are still so uh, scared and fearful. Like death is not talked about. Like, mm. um, it's a taboo and very scary thing. But I hope more they, they, they come to understand the process and yeah, not be afraid process. to die and not afraid to live either. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. Laura? Laurie? Yeah, Laurie. Yes, hi. I had two quick ones to share. Uh, my mom told us about when she was a young child, maybe a, a few years old, her grandfather had passed away shortly before, so she knew him. And she had a very high fever. And she said, my grandmother was holding her at the top of the stairs where you could see the front door. And she said that um, she could see her grandfather. And my grandmother said, what does he want? And she said, he said, he's coming to take me. And she told my mother to tell him that everything was going to be okay and that they didn't need his help and to go away. And he did. Um, and the second one was, um, my best friend's father was in the hospital, uh, in, uh, St. Francis, I believe, uh, with stomach cancer and he'd been put into a coma for a month. So we would go visit him even while he was in the coma and just take care about him as we could. And when he woke up, I was going to visit him and he fell and hit his head one day when he was in the bathroom. And when I came to visit him that afternoon, he told me that his father had come to see him and asked him for a loan. And he was convinced that his father had been there. And uh, and I said, so what did you tell him? He said, I said, there's no way I'm giving you any money. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of interesting. But those are the two things I had to share about that. Thank you, Laurie. Anyone else? Okay. Hi, I'm I'm Pat. I'm here with Walt. I have a question. 
Has anybody had an experience with uh, a bird that you think your uh, person that has passed has tried to communicate with you through a bird? Because we Um, have had, my daughters and I have had some experiences with cardinals appearing needed uh, we needed support okay Laura yes definitely um, especially cardinals and also morning doves for some reason but um, especially cardinals because uh, I'll tell you a quick story a friend of mine yes a friend of mine had uh, was really into cardinals. I mean, she had cardinals on every piece of clothing she owned, everything. And when she passed, her, her son uh, went to the, the cemetery the day before. He wanted to see where exactly where her plot was. And when he asked the, the guy at the cemetery, the guy said, well, it hasn't been dug yet, but he gave him the directions and he said, look for a white circle of line because we've, we've circled it, but it hasn't been dug yet. So that's how you'll know that's the one. So he's driving and he finds it. And as he pulled up, right in the middle of the white lime circle was a cardinal just sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we knew that was her. And I have another, another friend that has morning, morning doves show up all the time outside her house and um, her her husband had passed away, and she believes that the the morning dove that comes to visit her every day is is her husband. My daughter said she was in the car one day, and a cardinal sat on her her hood for the longest time, and she felt the presence of her father. Definitely, definitely. Very good. So, okay, John. John, hi, John. Do you have a question or a comment? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, first of all, it's great to be here. I wish we were in person again for the holiday party. Yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, you were talking about birds. Uh, we had at our house here in Willington a very interesting um, incident uh, when my uncle Eddie passed away about seven years ago in the spring, uh, we came back from uh, the, was it the funeral? Yeah, the funeral. And um, I, did it start? I could ask my wife, did it start that night or the next day? And the next morning, there's a sparrow on our big bow window for three days straight was pecking at the window. And I tell you, I tell you, it felt like it was my uncle Eddie's presence or something that he was pecking and he was trying to get inside the house for three straight days. <laughs> and then the bird went away. But, but I kind of, it felt like it had to do with the passing of my uncle, you know, it was very strange. Uh, we've been living here almost eight years, never had anything else like it guys. So it, it wasn't not a card cardinal or anything. But it was still a bird that was, you know, throwing himself against the window, trying to get our attention. It was really crazy. Yes, I've heard of stories such as that. Right. Always trust whatever comes to you, the mind or your heart when you see situations like that. Always exactly. trust those messages. Exactly. Thank you for letting me sharing it. share it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yep. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, Tina. No. Okay, Laura. Yeah, go ahead. Laura. And they, and they say dragonflies also. And yes. um, with a friend of mine, she was really into dragonflies. And when her husband was killed in a motorcycle accident, and she had this beautiful picture of a dragonfly on her wall. And um, the next day, that that painting was upside down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to say 
that over the years, uh, we have had many stories about birds being messengers um, by different people. Uh, there are so many, uh, I wouldn't take up the, the rest of the evening. So if anyone is interested in those stories, uh, I've had most of them uh, written up, I'd be happy to send them to you. Uh, email me at jackart31 at aol.com. You all have my email address. So I'd be happy to send that to you if you're interested. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Bethany, uh, you had a, a topic uh, about a conversation with loved ones who had passed. Do you want to uh, describe your, uh, your question? Yes, thank you so much, Jack, and good evening, everyone. It's so nice to be at this party. <laughs> um, so my question is, have you had a conversation with a loved one who has passed? And if so, um, how was it helpful to you? I, um, I had an um, experience, kind of a meditation, where I visited with my grandmother and those of you that have um, been here with me know that I just adored my grandmother. I used to visit her every Sunday. She passed, she was 99 years old um, on Christmas Eve and she was a gift. So it's no surprise to me that she passed on Christmas Eve. Um, but I had a meditation with her um, where I visited with her and I, of course, I was crying because I was so happy to see her and she was so alive and so beautiful in, um, in my experience. And I, um, so I, I'm having this experience where I'm visiting with her and I, I said to her, I said, Meme, why do you look old? I thought when people pass, they look young and, and you know, they're, they look in their 30s. And she said to me, um, you know, Bethany, I, I appear to you the way you need to see me. So this is, you know, next time you see me, I'll, I'll, I may look different. Um, and I asked her, um, you know, I was, I was crying and it was, um, I was crying and she said, you know, she asked me a question about my young son and, and I said, I know you're trying to change the subject. And she said, yes, I am, but you have to stop crying. Are you done yet? Um, you know, she just was, uh, she was in a good place. And I asked her about her son that had passed away a few days after he was born. His name was Clayton. And um, she said that he was there with her and he was just beautiful and she just loved him. Um, and that she was always with me, even when I didn't know and I wasn't talking with her, that she was still with me. And it was a very real experience. Um, I, I still like, I kept touching her face and her hair and her hands and, and telling her how real she was. And of course she said, yes, of course I am. Um, <laughs> and uh, then she disappeared. She, she kind of floated away. Um, she said she had, you know, other things she had to do, um, but that she was always with me. And it really helped me uh, um, come to terms with the fact that I can't go visit her anymore, but I can visit her anytime um, when I'm meditating. So that, that was my story and it really helped me. And I just wondered if anyone else had an experience like that. Bethany, thank you for sharing that. We have David, Mark on. Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Hi, David, yes. Hi, um, okay, so uh, mine's sort of similarly, similar to Bethany's. Um, about. 25 years, 20 years ago, whatever it doesn't, um, my kids were in middle school. Um, I'd always uh, had financial difficulties and always been worrying, how am I going to pay this bill? How am I going to, you know, and, uh, and then my parents passed away and I inherited some money, you know, not enough to retire or anything, but, you know, it was like, oh, I can get my kids through college and all that stuff. And uh, at the same time, I'd been going to the greater Boston IANS meeting a lot. So I was very interested in spiritual matters and I had been, experimenting i guess with trying to meet like a guardian angel or spirit guide and um but anyways so i inherited this money and i was i started worrying then about how can i maintain it like not for me but like hey i gotta pass this on to my kids um and uh 
anyways, make a long story short. I was one night I was meditating and trying to meet my spirit guides. And, um, all of a sudden, like, it was like, uh, my eyes were closed, but everything got really bright and I didn't see anything, but I felt the presence of my mother and behind her, my father. And, um, I just felt this unconditional love like I'd never felt before. And I, I didn't see them. They didn't speak to me, but I like, I got a message and the message was, you know, stop worrying. Like you may or may not go through the money. If you do just do your best and you're a good guy and don't worry about things, just do your best and stop worrying about all that stuff. And um, I, I still to this day don't know if it was my imagination or not, but it, it you know, I did proceed to mismanage it, but, <laughs> but I got my kids through college and everything. Um, but it was just, I never felt love like that. And, um, I wasn't looking to, I mean, I was happy to see them, but I wasn't looking to meet with my parents. So I guess it just changed me to like, okay, just do your best and stop worrying. So that's, that's my story. <laughs> David, it was definitely a visitation. So thank you for sharing that story. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi. Okay. Uh, phone that ends with 79. Oh, yeah. This is Bonnie again. Hi, Bonnie. <laughs> okay. uh, I, was, I, I was enjoying all of the, the visitation stories. I just love them. Um, and it only confirms, you know, again, that um, everything that we that we seem to think that is our imagination or we think, okay, is real. It's really real. I can, ex I can tell you some of like when my grandmother passed, um, she came to me the morning she was passing. And um, the time that she had passed was like nine in the morning. And that's the time. Okay. That she came to me and she woke me up. Okay. And then my daughter, at the same time, it happened to her at the same time, which my daughter lived with me. She woke up too. She says, Grammy passed. I said, yes, Grammy passed. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. And then, you know, about a, a year later, she um, came to me like in a visitation dream. I get visions. Those are totally separate, but this was a visitation dream. She came to me and, um, she said that um, she showed me where she was staying. She was at a place that was temporary, but she was happy and content. And um, she said to me, you can come anytime to visit me. Okay. Uh, you're more than welcome. And then she said, I have some bad news. And um, she was always, she was always like my mentor anyways. Um, she had abilities too. Um, but anyways, she had told me a few things that were going to happen. And she said, wear your seatbelt. And boy, was she right on target. Okay. What, what happened? And, um, after that, um, you know, then I ended up having, um, another visitation from a friend who, um, she was also, you know, in the psychic world, the spiritual world, and she had passed. I get, I kept on getting this feeling to get in touch with her lots sooner because she would talk to me every month. She lived in New York. And for some reason, um, I called her two weeks early. And I, I said, I just wanted to talk to her. And she said, okay. She goes, but I'm really not feeling good. And she didn't want to tell me what was wrong. Okay. Uh, so I said, okay, but I already knew what was wrong. But anyways, um, then I called back. Okay. When she was supposed to call back another two weeks, and I got her son, and her son told me she had passed. Then I had a dream of her, which, is, oh, she came to me in a dream, and she showed me where she was at. She was like in this holding, I call it a holding space. Um, and I went to go, I said, oh, please, and I hugged her, and she goes, oh, Bonnie, please don't touch me. I so much pain. She goes, I'm healing. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I was just so glad to see you. So, I mean, you know, that's where she, she had to go through getting released of all the pain that she was through. I've never seen anything like that. Okay. Um, I, I got my own kind of like, uh, versions of that. That's something, you know, and then, then there was another one with my friend, which, um, it was, um, Bethany, which 
it kind of like made me laugh a little bit because I took care of this nurse up in Maine when I was up in Maine for 21 years. And um, when she had passed, um, I saw her. And um, again, this was a vision. And I said to her, I said, uh, I said, oh, my God, you look well. I said, how do you like it? And I said, you moved. She said, I did. And I said, oh, well, at least you're on a main, main road. You know, you're not in the wilderness someplace. You're not in the backwoods because she lived like a cul-de-sac, okay, uh, up in Maine, you know, very nice, nice chalet and all that. But she was out. So she said, well, anyways, I said, well, thank you. She goes, what? She said, you know, she goes, you can come anytime. She says, I love you very much. And then all of a sudden, okay, I said, where are you going? There was no car, no nothing anywhere. And just like Bethany said, she flew away. It was like just amazing. And there's more stories about birds and stuff because I love birds, uh, all kinds of birds. I love butterflies and um, I love bees. So, you know, that's another story another time. But I just want to share some of those some of those Everybody. visitations. Now, when you, you mentioned a, a holding place, is that yes. in you your understanding, like uh, Bonnie, in your understanding, is the holding place a uh, place where people get prepared to go to the to the other side to the light okay. because they're healing to be done? Yes, I, I'm going to call this just what I saw. Just what I saw. You know how you know when Jesus died, he was in like that cave, that hole. That's the only way to describe it. She was standing outside in front. Okay, when she came out, so. It was like I was just so ecstatic. She was still in body form, the vision of a body form. So she did not go through the um, the transparency and the total healing. Okay, and that's and I that was a no no. How did I know it was a no no? Not to hug her at that time. I was just so glad to see her, and I said I didn't mean to cause you any pain, but she just wanted to let me know that she was all right, and then she, she thanked me, you know. Um, for calling and, you know, knowing that I was thinking about her. But, yes, that is a place. I've never seen it before. I think that's a place for people. Uh, I'm going to say this. Maybe people wouldn't like to hear this, but this it's only my way of thinking. Um, is that between maybe she had some problems of forgiving people. And so I think the not forgiving people is what put her there and where she had to learn to release, to let go, to advance. That's that's my feeling. So at however long it takes a person, but that's the only one I've ever seen like that. Really. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Laura? Laura? There's a, there's a paperback book called... The Afterlife of Billy Fingers. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. Love that book. Yes. And and it tell it's a true story of yes. a woman who for years had taken care of her brother who was an alcoholic and she had saved him many times. And she finally said no, no more. And he moved to Florida and he died there. And he started coming to her in her dreams. And at first she thought they were only dreams. But then he started talking about her friends and things that were going on with her friends. So then she knew that it, 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 he was really coming to her from the other side. And he did say that there were several different planes that he went through before he actually got to the other side. And I know that for a fact also because when my father passed, um, he had also had a drinking problem and we were not on the on the best of terms. And um, yep, that's it. And um, when he, he passed, um, maybe uh, six months after that, I was at a message circle with Joyce Orkut. And she said, I can't start the circle because there's someone here that needs to give a message. And it was my dad. She described him to a T, even his name. And and um, she said, he's asking for your help. And so afterwards, I asked her, what does that mean? And, and she said, he's, um, he's stuck on a plateau and he needs your help to move on. And I asked her how I could do that. And she said, 
every time you look at a picture of him, send him blessings. And, and about a year after that, at a different message circle with a different person, he told me that my dad came through and said, um, thank you, and, and I'm in a good place now. Yeah. Yeah, there's a similar uh, story such as that when my father came to me as well. Uh, it's in my book. Um, the day, the same day that he, he passed away, he came to visit me that, uh, that evening. And there was definitely a, a turning point as far as the, uh, you know, understanding and forgiveness and all that. It was a very uh, wonderful gift. Anyone else? <clears throat> Okay. Uh. Uh, Tina, uh, Diane had had her hand up, I thought. Oh, okay. No? I didn't see it. Sorry. Diane, are you still there? Go ahead, Diane. Yes, I am. Okay, um, Diane. Actually, all that I had to think was spoken, but since I have the podium, <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me so much of um, a Catholic purgatory. I'm Catholic. So purgatory to me was always the place you got to go to take a breath and breathe and get over the crap you did in this incarnation so you could go where you're supposed to be. And that's what it all reminds me of. And it's comforting to me um, that that might be truth. But I think it is. I think we do have the opportunity to take a break and just get over some crap that we did, maybe so we could get on and look at it from another perspective. And if I, that's why I unraised my hand because everybody spoke and that was what I had to say. <laughs> so, yeah. Very good. Thank you, Diane. Any, anyone else? Any other? Comments? Okay, the next topic is from Laurie. Uh, Laurie, would you uh, present your, your uh, question about positive and negative experiences? Microphone. Mike. Mike. <laughs> Microphone. <laughs> Laurie. I got it. I got it. Okay. Um, yeah, the wording of my question, I was trying to go look at it um, so that I could uh, read it as I wrote it. Uh, my question, when people relate their positive and negative NDEs, they believe the experience is real or more real than an earthly life. I've heard it described that if one has a negative NDE, it's created by the experiencer based on their beliefs, emotions, and subconscious. Do people tend to believe that the positive ones are more real and that the negative ones are created by the person experiencing it or that both types are related to the experiencer's state of mind and being? This seems to be a, a topic uh, discussed quite often between NDEers and it almost seems to me like they're saying that the negative NDE, oh, you created that, but the positive NDE was really real. So that's kind of my question. Okay. If anyone has comments, I'd love to hear them. Diane, go ahead. Sound please. Okay. Oh my go God, ahead. I have a comment. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I was a young woman I was 25 years old, I drowned. My thing, and I'm gonna short circuit this because we've all had our own experiences, but I was told I had an opportunity. I could not go back, but I was suggested or perhaps more than suggested to go back because I had to help my child through an extraordinarily difficult life and that I would be given, and this is all the stuff I was told, I would be given the strength. I would given, be given the experience and the strength to do this. And I went back. 
And I will say this too, when I drown, I drown with another person. We were being cavalier, we were gods, we were immortal. And we went out where we were told you should not swim, but we were incredibly good swimmers. And we were going to body surf in, we were going under the breakers and body surf in. Oh, I'm, I'm not gonna even go through all of that. I'm gonna say that, that we both drowned both had similar experiences and different income outcomes. I was told I had to go back to help that child. Okay. I'm 25 years old. <laughs> I mean, more, eh, cool. That child was not born yet. The child was not born for 10 years, but I never, ever got over what am I supposed to do? And I had a child, but through his growing up, I understood this was not, his life wasn't that crazy. What's going on here? When the other child was born 10 years later and the things that happened and the horrific things that happened throughout his life, but always happened to me just before. And then I got it. Oh, my God. That NDE, that sent back, and being told to do what I had to do, and I am short-circuiting this, was for somebody who wasn't born for 10 years. So, wow, that changed my life when I figured it out. For the whole time, I was always wondering. But when I got it, well, now I have much more to wonder about. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what I'm going to say to that. Well, uh, Diane, it sounds to me like yours was a life review. I also drowned in my uh, in my middle uh, 20s. And I saw past and I saw future uh, in, in reference to what was happening to me at that time. By the time I was uh, out of the water, I was pulled out of the water, um, I knew, I, I felt like I, I had been given the strength to be able to, to do what I needed to do with my present husband at the time. Basically, divorce him. And uh, it was just so clear, the, the strength that I received through that drowning, which I think according to IANS, the uh, International Association of near Death Studies, that's considered a life review. So I don't know if that explains <laughs> your question, uh, Laurie, but um, those are our experiences. Anyone else? Can I say something, Tina? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, when you when you say life review, okay, what my NDE experience, I was 15. Um, it was, I don't know if you want to call it a moped or a motorcycle bike or whatever. I was the passenger. And um, anyways, I ended up, okay, floating up. I'm not getting into the details because that's not what I want to talk about. Uh, I just want to talk about the fact that the life review that when I floated up at that point in time, it was a life review because they sent me right up to the Akashic records. And um, I was seeing a whole bunch of stuff on me and um, I was sent to other parts. Like I, I call it like a university too. Uh, where they were just telling me of life rules, okay, here on this planet. But the point was is that um, I felt that um, it, it was positive and negative, okay, because the positive was is that I learned that there was something else besides here, that there was life after death, as they call it. This is our death, really. Okay, and life. And uh, the negative was, is that I didn't want to come back. I did not want to come back. 
Oh, because you see everything. Everything's explained to you. You have clarity in your mind. Everything is like given to you. The warmth, it's beautiful. Everything, it's just great. But the point was, is that they said that um, I could, I could have a choice. I could stay or I could go back. Um, at that time, I was only 15. So I, really, it was just me and what was going on in my life. But they did tell me if I stayed, I would have to come back and do this again. And it wasn't guaranteed who the people would be in my life, the parents. It would be totally different. So um, I gave it a thought. I said, okay, I'll go back. And they warned me it was going to be quite painful, okay, uh, to the fact of what coming back into the physical body, what I had to endure, and years of other learning lessons and um you know so i just wanted to tell you that that's all thank that's you Bonnie. anyone else hi can i say something yes this is walt walter hi okay go ahead um i've seen feel i've learned a lot since the year uh 1999 uh before See, I was an engineer, and if two plus two didn't equal four, it was wrong. And uh, I would see uh, before 1999, I saw advertisements in the paper or for uh, psychic fairs or, th or other uh, things like that, and I, I thought, eh, that's all a baloney. And... Uh, uh, and I just passed it off. Well, 1999, I met a guy named Jack. Something drew me to a store, uh, gift store opening in Brantford. One, and they had a special night. And uh, I don't know whatever made me go, but I did. And I met Jack, you know, our Jack. And... Uh, he invited me to go to NDE meeting, and I put it off for a month, but I went the next month, and um, I heard uh, some stories, some NDE stories, and I related mine, and uh, um, since, oh boy, since then I had, well, after I started going to the meeting, I was having Reiki sessions. Uh, I had bad back and knees, and uh, during two of the Reiki sessions, I had NDEs or SDEs, as I'm told they're called. I don't care what you call them, NDE, SDE. I was over the other side. I crossed over to the other side, and uh, but the last two NDEs or SDEs that I had, uh, uh, I asked my spirit spirit guide. Uh, uh, to let me stay there. I didn't want to leave. It was really nice. And the spirit, my spirit guide said, you have to go back. It's not your time. And, I, and the second, so the second time she said that, I said, why do I have to go back for it? She said, you'll find out. Uh, I've been finding out. <laughs> it's a, it's a, Nice experience. I've met a lot of good people that have helped me along the way. Um, and maybe I've helped them a little bit too. Yes. Uh, well, I, so I, for me, it didn't have to do with my state of mind, I don't think, because I was really anti um, NDE and anti psychic, anti-whatever uh, believer. And uh, and now, uh, just like anyone else who's had an NDE, I'm not afraid to die. And in fact, I, uh, when my wife was alive, I never, I never talked to her about it. I told her about the NDE meetings, and she went to a couple. But well, I believe that I would go first and that my wife would leave, live on and on for a long time. Well, my wife passed first. 
and I'm still here. And whatever the reason is, I don't know. But um, I'm not negative about it or positive. I'm just uh, doing what I, the next best thing. That's all, that's how I'm uh, going through life now. I'm not saying two plus two equals four. Uh, stuff like that. I, it could equal five. I don't care. It doesn't matter. And um, so anyway, it, it didn't have to do with my state of mind, whether it was positive or negative. My MDEs or SDEs were, all three were positive. And uh, so, well, anyway, that's what I have to say. Thanks, Thanks Walter. Anyone else? <clears throat> okay. Um, Matthew uh, has asked a question. He's interested in the NDEers who have encountered religious figures like Jesus, Buddha, etc. And that they may have been atheists at that time or non practicing Christians. And um, he, he's interested in knowing. Um, if you were um, an atheist or non-practicing Christian, um, uh, how you converted, or did you? Can I say something, Tina? Sure, go ahead. Hey. I'm sorry, but that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, I've, I've gone to church the first 37 years of my life, okay? And I'm a believer. Okay, and Jesus, okay, and I believe there's a God source, a God head, okay, but Jesus was put in our image, so we could be late. Um, what was I, no, I, I just lost the train of thought. What, what, but anyways, it's, what I was trying to say was, is that um, it, it has nothing, you know, Tina, I lost my train of thought. Um, Jack, Matt, can you rephrase that question because I got cut off a minute here with my thought process. Jack? Hello? Matt, was it Matt that said it? Was it Matt? Yeah. He wants to know about the NDE. Yes, but so as far as, like I said, I've, for 37 years I've been like, I know what it was. It was, I've you know, been going to church and I believe in Jesus and I, I'm not overly religious and spiritual, but the one thing I found like when my dad passed last year from COVID, my dad never talked about God. He, it's not that he didn't want to go to church. Um, I think that because of the, his experiences from the Korean war and when he came back, you know, everything, he was not the same man that left from what everybody told me. But when he, we didn't have a good relationship, my dad and I, unfortunately, I wish we did. But when he passed away, um, he did come back. He did. He came back and thanked me. He said, thank you. Cause I was there at his passing. And so he knew exactly. He told me, I, he knew exactly what time I was going to leave. I said, I was going to leave nine o'clock. Okay, or whatever. And he passed 901 thinking that I had left, but I stayed that night. But what I found was, is that when he came to me, he um, also, I saw a vision with him being happy at, in his 30s and um, him being with Jesus fishing. Jesus was trying to teach him how to fish. So that to me is the vision that I saw my father. So that I, I'm so happy. I'm just so happy. And my dad had said he was sorry. You know, he had said that he was sorry that he wished he knew, you know, but he didn't. But anyways, but that's that as far as the religion with Jesus and my father learning how to fish, which is a good thing. And he said, he's coming back. He's going to come back and do another life. And that's it. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay. Whoa, whoa. Oh, okay. I gotta ask. Who's Diane. coming back, your father or Jesus or both? Serious question. 
Bonnie? Yes, I'm here. Uh, it, was it your father that's coming back or is it Jesus? Yes, that was the my, question from Diane. My father, my father's going to come back because what he said to me after he said he was sorry, okay, and Jesus was teaching him how to fish, you know, we know what that means, you know, the fish of men and, you know, being more kinder and everything. Uh, he He's going to come back because he said to me he wants to know what it's like to be really loved. Wow. So that told me why I've had the problems I've had with him. It's all hindsight now, but the point is, is that I get it. And um, he's going to come back as one of uh, one of my uh, grand uh, great grandchildren. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you, Bonnie. You're welcome. I'm sorry I get forgetful. Oh, you did great. Thank you. Anyone else? I um. Uh... Uh, Tina, this is Walt again. Yes, Walt. Um, I had an experience once. Um, um, I think it was with, with a hypnotist. And anyway, my uh, father-in-law, who had passed away, I remember him talking with my father uh, when they were both alive. And... Um, saying to each other that they didn't believe that there was anything else once you died, that that was it. There was nothing else. And when this, during this experience with, uh, with a hypnotist, the, uh, my father-in-law came to me and said, he liked what I was doing with the, with my yard, the way I kept it up. Now, I didn't do anything really special. I raked the leaves, cut the grass. That was it. I fertilized, maybe. But uh, I told my wife about the experience. She said, oh, that's my father. He'd say something like that. <laughs> and we both chuckled about it. But I said, so you think that, that was... That was real. This was before I uh, was at the Andy E meetings, I believe. And I really didn't know that uh, my wife really uh, knew her father that well. And, uh, yeah. And my son, who owns his own home now in, uh, in uh, New Haven, he said one day he was in this apartment and he uh, he felt uh, somebody blow on the back of his ear. And he said, I swear that was grandpa, you know, grandfather in French. And uh, meaning my wife's father and my father-in-law. And uh, so anyway, that's my experiences. Thank you, Walter. Uh, okay. So okay. Do we, uh, Jack? Do we have a, a, any other anything else that we need to discuss, or do we go to uh, the meditation, the healing meditation? I'd like to uh, um, discuss the N how the NDE affects marital relationships after the experiencer has returned. Okay. There's a very high incidence of divorce <laughs> in the years um, because they change radically and the partner generally feels that the person is no longer who they married. So that's open for discussion. Who's up? Jim, I'm so glad you're still here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm one of the statistics. Uh, when I came home from my plane crash and was realizing I had a near-death experience, I found the IONS website. And at that time, it, it had a good bit of information about these after effects, not this, just the after effects of uh, electronic anomalies, but the after effects societally. And mm -hmm. so um, and it, at that time, and this is five almost five years ago, it said, you know, the average divorce rate 
in the United States was 53%. Said among indie ears, it was 78%, which is 50% more than the already epidemic rate with normal people. And I, uh, I guess every day I got a little closer to being that statistic until it was finalized um, on December 1st, just a couple weeks ago. And uh, Diana DeFranco, who was the NDE knowledgeable therapist I found on the site, was here in the um, Branford, Guilford area along the coast of Connecticut. So I reached out to her, went to see her a few times. We stayed in touch and uh, we actually presented on the subject at the IN's conference a couple of months ago because I feel like this aspect of integration is, I don't know if it's overlooked, but I think it needs to be addressed to a greater degree. Because let's face it, if we have this incredibly spiritually transformative experience, but at the cost of you know, watching what may be the most important relationship in our life fall apart at the rate of almost three out of four, more than three out of four, it needs to be talked about. It may not be fixable, but it does need to be discussed maybe a little bit more than workshops on how to talk to dead people. I'm just calling it like it is. Because, you know, like Jesus said, you know, what does it benefit to, you know, inherit the world if you lose your soul? I'm kind of putting it in the same boat. Otherwise, we might as well not get married because the odds are against us by over 75%. Well, that I don't think... I mean, remember, we did come here to have a human experience, whether we have our feet pointed homeward or not. You know, we are here. I mean, we've all come to Disney World. We want to ride the rides. And to have that taken away from us to that degree is, you know, pretty amazing. Now, again, those statistics may only be American. I don't know. You know, and they say that maybe 5% of the world has had an NDE. That is 60 million more people than live in the United States. That's a lot of people. I can't imagine that 78% of them are getting divorced, but I certainly could see it here in America. I don't know in places that may be more traditional and less progressive. But anyway, it is, it is, um, it is important to remember that when you have that like reboot <clears throat> from your NDE, and you become whoever you are, version 2.0, that people are going to look at you differently. People are going to relate to you differently. Um, you know, with regards to your spouse, your values change, your shared hopes and dreams change, your even your shared, let's just call it what it is, prejudices change. How you deal with things that are unexpected and new changes. Um, and you look like their spouse, you sound like their spouse, but it becomes apparent more every day it's not. We went to 18 months of marriage therapy, and it, uh, <laughs> I guess, I guess there was just no fixing it. Um, but we, you know, we did try. So it, it's something to be aware of. And here's what I thought is, you know, in terms of how best to support, because IANS took down its page of therapeutic resources. And I've talked to them. I've talked to their board uh, in the past few months. I said, why? Who are you serving? If I was created as an organization for a specific population and 78% of them were having this earthquake of an experience, I think I would talk about it. And they, they're hearing the message. And so I think we're starting to see more support in the ISGO groups, more targeted um, conversations about integrating your experience in the face of difficult challenges. And I said, you know, as far as a model, let's face it, if you're looking for a therapeutic resource, you've got one of two ways you can go. Which, like, school of psychology, so to speak, or psychiatry even, uh, do you favor? You know, do you favor a Freudian, a Jungian, Gestalt, behavior modification? What do you feel would help you integrate and adjust and cope the best. But just because a person is a brilliant therapist, if they don't recognize the validity of your experience that's brought you into their office, I'm going to say it right now. Run. Don't walk. 
mean, especially if it's marriage therapy, because there'll be two sane people in that office and one crazy one. You know what I'm saying? Uh, or you could look for help within the NDE community. And I really think, and I, I think this so far because this is as far as I've been able to take it. I may be wrong, I may be wrong, but only if we tried it, that perhaps we need something more like an AA model because like in Alcoholics Anonymous, help comes from within the community. You know, who better should, in theory, be able to relate to our experience than other experiencers? Even when we're like when you go to IANS or when you go anywhere and you hear stories of a person's near death experience, it's so weird. They can have what on paper would sound like a totally different experience, different milestones, different reference points, different experiences, and different takeaways. But somehow it sounds like we're still saying the same thing. And to the uninitiated, they don't understand that at all because it sounded so different. But there's a resonance there that is the same. And so I feel like uh, maybe, like I said, an AA model where we have help from within our community. Because even if there's not like a therapist who's going to have all these answers to unanswerable questions, just to have people say, I've been through this and I might have a perspective that helps. I'm not an authority, but I am a fellow traveler. That could be so validating to the angst of that coping. And here's one subtle, couple of subtle things that come out of that. So the idea, I mean, imagine you were sitting in a big circle or something, just like whatever they do in AA. Imagine there are like 50 people there or 40 people or 30 people, whatever. But imagine that, okay, 78% of them could speak to what it was like having to deal with the eventual death of your marriage. But also it means that maybe 22% could tell you how they survived it how their marriage survived it, they have something to say. Uh, and it has to do then with really focusing on better communication. And it also has to do with focusing on the spouse who was left behind. How do we help them catch up? How do we help them look at this experience from multiple ways to see if they're ready to accompany their spouse on this quantum jump spiritual journey. So, I mean, I could go on and on probably all night about this because I've given it a lot of thought, obviously having gone through it, but um, that that's <laughs> that's where I'm at on it, Jack and Tina. Oh, thank you for sharing, Jim. Very uh, much. Question, Jim. Um, when you and your wife began to see that you were having major differences, what was the major, uh, quote, complaint, unquote, by your wife? In, I, can, I can speak to that both in general and specifically. In general, it had to do, um, I was struggling with detachment. I was very detached. I was struggling to be, be attached. I could just sit here. A year later, I could sit here and just stare at a wall for six hours, straight on. And I was fine because I just really kind of wasn't here. Or one, only one foot was here and one foot was over on the other side. And I was just fine with that. And so she walked into my office again almost a year to the day and said, we're going to therapy. I said, okay, fine. And so I didn't, I don't think she um, communicated with me and I didn't. And I failed to ask because I guess I just was one of the complaints you'll sometimes hear when someone's assimilating a near-death experience, people will say, gosh, you're so self-absorbed. Well, yeah, I guess you kind of are. I mean, you're, you're going through this rediscovery. You ask every day. It's what was true yesterday, still true today. It's kind of like being a, a child. You know, you know how children are very self-absorbed because they're also going through this rapid growth and rapid uh, process of self-discovery and definitely what was true yesterday isn't true today because the toy that they just had to have no matter what yesterday tomorrow is gathering dust under the bed that process continues on throughout most of our lives um 
so that that I would say figuring out a ways to figuring out ways to kind of try to reattach was was definitely a challenge that was on me. Um, I would say that, and I'm just a very open person. Um, I would say where we really came to another difference in perspective was when our 18 year old daughter came home pregnant and she had a very nice boyfriend. He was going to stick around all that. My wife's reaction was get an abortion. Well, she had these kids in Catholic church every Sunday and she taught CCD, which is like Sunday school. So I just looked at her and I said, I think I know what the Catholic church's position is on this. And I'm kind of surprised that you're taking this path. And she literally was saying, yeah, but I'm going to be so embarrassed to introduce my 18 year old pro uh, pregnant daughter to the community we live. I said, okay. And I looked at my daughter and said, whatever you want to do. I said, I'm kind of excited. I said, I wouldn't mind helping raise it. I'll build out the basement as an apartment. My natural reaction was, okay, you know, that there are no accidents. This, the timing of this is right. And also her being a mother was one of the things I saw when I was having my NDE. So I was fine. But the main thing I told her was, you can't hear that quiet voice inside your head if you have everybody outside shouting at you what to do. And if in the end, you have to hear that voice so you know what to do, because if you don't know what you're supposed to do and you do something someone else tells you to do, you're living their life, not yours. And you're accruing karma doing things you never wanted to do that you're going to have to come back and answer for. So just whatever you want to do, I'm quietly supporting you. In the end, the baby decided it wasn't coming after three months on its own. So it's kind of interesting how this was a dress rehearsal for pulling back the mask and showing everybody where they really stood on something very important. And we were polar opposite. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm thinking that maybe we should think about the possibility of of uh, asking a uh, a counselor uh, to touch on this specific subject in the future. I would, I mean, only because I, I seriously only know of one NDE. I mean, unless you know you're talking to someone like you know Paul Arand who does Life Between Life Regressions, because that's a part of people integrating. That's part of people. Uh, people's path of coping and integrating and growing and, and so yeah. on. But I would recommend if you would like uh, for one of our sessions, we get Diana again, she's had an NDE. She's yeah. in her hands. She's a yes. recommended counselor. She was my co-presenter. I would recommend we, if you'd like, we uh, have her host one night. Yeah. That's a thought. We'll, we'll discuss that. Thank you very much, Jim. Sure. And you know we're running out of time, but uh, uh, we still would like to do the uh, the healing meditation for Laura's daughter, who's in the hospital. Was she in the hospital, Laura? Did she leave? No, she's home, but she's oh, okay. pretty sick. Sick. Okay, so <laughs> shall we uh, intentionally send healing meditation silently to her? Jack. Okay. Well, um, uh, we we can do we can do both. Uh, we can have our meditation uh, <clears throat> for her daughter, um, and then another one which is more focused. So, um, uh, would you would you like to uh, uh, would you uh, uh, give us your daughter's name and uh, um, where she's um, where where she's at right now. I mean, is she in the hospital or is she at home? No, where she's she's home. Her name is Jennifer. And where is she? And she where is her in, home? She lives in Bolton. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh, she's here in Connecticut. Yes, Bolton, Connecticut. Yes. Oh, okay. Jennifer. All right. Uh, uh, Tina, do you want to take us through the meditation? 
well, I, I think it could be a, a silent one by intention. We just uh, focus on her whole body uh, healing and not being affected uh, from this uh, situation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. May the energy continue to work on behalf of Jennifer and also anyone else that may need to be at peace with themselves, especially around these holidays. I want to wish everyone a happy new year and uh, we'll see you in January, where Jim is going to be our great speaker. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts, your energies. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year. Happy New, New Year. Let's go your family. Bye now. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Goodbye.